Welcome everyone to our second in the series of our 10 free talks to get your craft business ready for the digital and physical opportunities in 2021 and beyond. These talks have been created by the Crafts Council and funded by Crafting Europe. We welcome questions from our audience. Please use the Q&A function and my colleague Tanvi will be joining us later to help facilitate your questions. We're also recording this webinar, which will be available next week, and we will send you a link to that recording once we have, have it ready. Before I welcome our guests, Patricia van der Ecke from the Design Trust and Julia Bennett, Crafts Council Head of Research and Policy, I would like to set some context of how building customer profiles can support your business. Firstly, the rationale. Why are we doing this? Building customer profiles simply means you have better understanding of who your customers are so that all of your efforts and your energy can be targeted to a specific demographic. The research. Factor in research to build your database of knowledge. We recommend 10% of research development to be factored into your business model. Research into how your role model or your competitors structure their businesses. Can this research initiate new ideas for your own business structure? Later on, Julia Bennett will be sharing our new Market for Craft interactive tool for independent makers, studios, collective shops and galleries. Using the data tools, tabs and filters, you can gain a detailed insight into your customer's demographics, behaviours, motivations and barriers. So on to marketing. Once identifying your customer profiles, you can then be more focused with your marketing, meaning the best way of how to communicate your craft business, being more considered with your marketing will have much better results. Structure. This is the when, where and how. The majority of your customers may prefer direct messaging or in-person events. You can therefore build specific marketing structure behind promoting your business according to your audience's preferences. Planning. We always recommend having a plan. Plans need to have a set of actions and goals to work towards. Set a goal based on your research of when you want to communicate. This can be your campaign. Allow time to implement your plan. Set deadlines and using the concept of the project planning tool of planning backwards to help see if your deadlines are achievable or do you actually need more time. Connections. Who is already on your mailing list? Are these people, these are the people that are already interested in your work? Do they already fit the customer profile you have identified or are they different? Look at the data you already have. Only the future, this is the long game. Businesses naturally want to develop and grow. It makes them competitive and keeps their businesses fresh. As craft businesses, creativity drives us forward and as a result, our customers may change also. Continue with your research into customer profiles and your businesses will sustain and grow. I will now hand over to our guest, Patricia van der Ecke from the Design Trust. Remember, if you have any questions, please do pop them into the Q&A. We will have questions following Patricia's talk before hearing from Julia and the Market for Craft data tool. 
Over to you, Patricia. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. And apologies for the slight delay there. But let's get started with how to build customer profiles. And just to remind you, um, indeed, like you will be getting the presentation of of this session as well. Um, but indeed, that will be in probably a week. So just be aware of that. Um, so my name is Patricia van der Neck, and I'm really delighted to have been invited by the Crafts Council for this um, yes, special event. And it might be a little bit kind of geeky or a little bit dry indeed as a um, kind of discussion or indeed a uh, yeah a workshop uh, for designer makers but I actually think it's very very interesting indeed and I hope that indeed in this session I can show you how you can use customer profiles in a way that can really help you with your business in many many different ways so let's get started a little bit more about myself I've been a creative business advisor trainer and coach for over 25 years I was selected the number one business advisor for branding and design by Enterprise Nation in 2018 and for sales in 2019. I grew up in the Netherlands and I've lived in North London for the last 25 years. My very first job was indeed at the Crafts Council many, many years ago. But indeed, for the last 10 years, I have taken over the Design Trust, which was originally set up by Peter Levi in the 1980s. And we are now an online business school, uh, yeah, specifically indeed for creatives to really help people to uh, yeah, build and grow their businesses. Uh, I talk regularly about uh, creative business development. We've got a lot of blog posts on our website and videos as well. And for five years, I wrote indeed a business column called The Design Doctor for Craft Magazine. And I also launched indeed a couple of years ago, uh, a diary planner or business planning. And indeed, like I'm very much uh, interested in planning for creatives as well. So that's a little bit more about myself. I don't work indeed for the Crafts Council. We are an independent organization. So what we're going to do today is uh, really looking at who are your ideal clients really? What are the six core client questions? Create your own client collages, which is one of the most fun and creative exercises I think you can do as a designer maker. Then you will be looking at how to identify your ideal clients. And then we sort of take a step back and we will be looking at why is understanding that so important. And indeed, we will be looking at how can this kind of practical market research and the client personas really help you in your craft business because it is the application or the use of this kind of information within your business that is really what is at the heart of what we're talking about in this session today. So who are your ideal clients really? This is indeed one of the questions we get asked very often within the design trusts. So let's get started on a very broad basis. Very, yeah, one of the first questions I would ask is, do you want to sell to consumers or do you want to sell to trade? And what are you actually selling to them? Are you selling indeed products? Yeah, your work, beautiful craft pieces, or is it actually... Yeah, something bigger than that, your brand or the package in a certain way. Maybe you're doing commissions and you might think that commissions are very similar to actually having a product for sale. But actually, it's very, very different when it comes to yeah how you sell and promote yourself and understanding the kind of people who actually buy yeah finished work or people who are actually buying indeed commissions. And then, of course, what has become very popular, especially during the lockdown, yeah, is indeed experiences. So, yeah, do you do workshops, training, education in the broadest sense of the world? So those are some of the basic questions to get started with. Then the next question around who are your clients really is starting to look at demographic and social economic information, as we so beautifully <laughs> say that. What is your gender, your age? Yeah, what is their income level, ethnicity, for example? And then also looking at jobs or hobbies. Start to look at where they live, both in terms of location. So are they living predominantly in urban areas, for example, or more in the countryside, for example? But also I would be looking at what kind of houses do people, for example, live? What kind of life or family stage are they at? And what are their values? What's important to them? And I have to say that when I was learning about marketing 25 years ago, 
basically you had enough information there to identify who your potential clients would be. But these days it has all become a bit yeah, more chaotic in certain ways. And we are looking a lot more around whose tribe do you belong to? So yeah, 25 years ago, if you would know that somebody yeah, that would be between 40 and 60 year old and they would be living in London and they're female, then that would give you quite a lot of a good idea about like, yeah, if they would be buying your kind of work, yes or no. But indeed now you need to go a lot deeper. So I also suggest uh, when we are working with our clients about identifying who their clients are, is to go beyond that and really look at firstly, what is their design style? Because let's be honest, yeah, like um, your creative clients will mostly buy it because they like it or they not they don't like it. Yes. Yeah? So what is their design style? What is your design style in a certain way? If you then create work for the home, I also would actually go and think a little bit deeper about what kind of house do they live in? Do they live in yeah, a Victorian house in Hackney, for example? Or yeah, is it in a penthouse? Or is it indeed like their second home in Cornwall or something like that? So if you are creating indeed items more aimed at the home, then indeed identifying a bit more their design style related to that home or their office or things like that, that can really help you to connect far better with your potential clients. If you're doing more things around, uh, yeah, indeed, uh, body accessories, jewelry, fashion accessories, things like that, then also start to think about, indeed, what fashion brands do they wear? If you could look in their wardrobe, what would you see? What kind of colors? Where do they buy, indeed, their, uh, yeah, their fashion? Uh, what brands do they regularly use? Where do they shop? And indeed, related to some of that, it's like, yeah, which hotels or restaurants do they love? Because this kind of information can really give you a very good kind of psychological picture of who your clients are. So from, yeah, going quite broad about trade versus consumer, then going a bit deeper, and we go deeper and deeper again. So it's a bit like unpeeling like an onion in many ways to really get to understand a lot more who your clients are. And then what you can create here is a kind of a client collage. So this is an example indeed that one of our clients did a couple of years ago. And she wrote a little client persona or client bio yeah, a biography uh, with this. So indeed she gives them a name, an age. Yeah, she gives them a family, a dog, I think even. Yeah, a location of where they're living. And then really talks quite a bit about who this person is and why they buy, where they buy, the kind of uh, design style they do and things like that. And you can do this kind of collage indeed, like as an old fashioned way. Yeah, like indeed create a poster, do it with the old uh, print stick or something like that. Or this could be really interesting indeed as a kind of a secret Pinterest board and really start collecting and identifying yeah, visually who your clients are. And then you can go even deeper. And I really love these next six core client questions. If you really want to understand who your clients are, these very simple questions can really give you a far deeper kind of idea. So firstly, indeed, who are they? Yeah, identify a certain group of people that you are selling to. And by the way, you'll probably have between four, five to about eight different client groups. Don't put them all together in one kind of person because then you are kind of creating a bit of a monster with three hats, so to speak. Don't do that. So basically you identify firstly a certain type of client uh, group, for example, and you say, okay, these are the people uh, yeah, who are uh, kind of collecting indeed my high-end uh, sculptural uh, ceramics or something like that, for example. Then start to look at why do they buy What's their motivation? And this gets really quite interesting in terms of psychology. How does their purchase or how does owning your work make them feel? And what is it especially that they yeah, love about buying or owning your work? And it's really interesting to start really becoming more aware of why people love crafts. 
and what it really means to them. Very often, it's very much connected to identity, for example, how it makes them feel a certain way, how it expresses a certain part of their own identity, for example. Another question is, when do they buy? And this is both related to a specific time of the year. Many craft businesses are very seasonal. So I work with many designer makers and let's be honest, 60, 70% of your turnover comes from the last yeah, couple of uh, weeks of, of the year, especially if you're based in the UK. Christmas is incredibly important when it comes to yeah, the right period of when people buy your kind of work. But also this is related very often to certain live events for people. And that is a special occasion, for example, when they buy. So it might be that, yeah, they have just had a baby, for example, and they're looking for something for the nursery or something like that. Or it might be that they're celebrating a 50th birthday or a, yeah, a 50th wedding anniversary or something like that. So really start to become a lot more aware, when do they buy? When do they use yeah, your kind of work and use in the broader sense of the world? Or when do they give it indeed to somebody? Where do they look? Where do they browse? Especially if it is more higher end work, yeah, they will need to have some information. They might be going to certain craft fairs or maybe they don't. Maybe they like yeah, looking at Etsy, for example, or places like that. So who do they get information from? Is that their friends? Do they read things on social media, for example? How does that work? Because, of course, what you need to start thinking about is, yeah, you need to be in these places as well to show what you potentially can mean to them. Where do they buy? Really start to identify specific shops, galleries, websites, events that really work with your kind of products. And don't just look at the obvious ones, but really start to look a lot more at what is your niche, what is special about what you do, and where would that potentially be available? And then an extra question that I love <laughs> yeah, introducing there is what stops people from buying from you yeah, right now? For example, on your website, which is, of course, very important in 2021 as one of the best ways to show your work, educate your potential clients and yeah, buy from you, hopefully, is like, yeah, what do they need to know? What are their questions? What worries them? And it might be sometimes tiny things that stops them, yeah, to actually, yeah, click that button to say, I want to buy from you. So a good tip there, what you can also do with the, your answers to these questions is actually, yeah, add them to your client biographies. Or indeed, like what we call an empathy map in design thinking theory is really looking at what do they think, feel, yeah, hear about your kind of work. So what you then can create is something like this. And this is indeed a uh, biography uh, persona and collage that indeed one of our clients did uh, in yeah, three years ago now. And what I really love is that this jeweler really describes this older woman very independent. Uh, she used to be indeed like a, a lawyer and she really describes this person, but also she really answers those questions like what does she like in terms of style? Uh, what does she like in terms of yeah, the expression? And especially when it comes to jewelry, jewelry is really interesting. People don't just buy jewelry. Yeah, Jewelry are very often a, signif a significant kind of personal purchase it's very much about expressing who you are and so indeed yeah this designer maker really explains in this description here yeah like uh, if you can uh, look there I think it's the fourth linear the design she chooses tends to be more sculptural and geometric due to her architectural background she likes to wear rings and earrings which make her feel empowered the jewelry she wears will be eye-catching and people will ask about it when noticed at business meetings and conferences conferences. So she's really gone into the shoes of her potential client, really starting to answer those questions around why do they buy, when do they buy, and things like that. And that gives you then a really good kind of visual idea of who your clients are. And I think that is really useful because it becomes then beyond just the numbers, but these people really come a lot more alive. And what you can do then indeed, especially if you've created 
kind of a poster with like your visuals and indeed remember to make more than one yeah at least yeah four or five put those in your studio space and it can really inspire you then to create better work more innovative work and really for the right people yeah that can really really work very well so yeah my kind of challenge to you is yeah start to become a bit more curious about who your ideal clients are or who your current clients are. And of course, there can sometimes be a bit of a difference between yeah, your current clients and indeed, yeah, basically your ideal clients. And if there is a big gap, you need to start thinking indeed about how you can bridge that. So yeah, my homework for any of you on the call here today is create your own series of client collages. Probably takes, I would say, yeah, a good day and we have seen it over the last few years with our clients. Yes, it is a bit of a job, but actually when they do it, they get so much out of it for many, many different reasons. And I will show you in a minute exactly why this is such a good idea. Just to get you thinking also there, I started this kind of exploration about who your clients are, about dividing yeah, them very broadly into trade clients and consumers. And very often people get a bit confused and ask me questions around that. Um, but indeed, like trade clients and consumers are often very alike. Yeah, especially in terms of their style or what they like, but also in their values. Yes. Yeah, so, for example, indeed, if somebody is interested in ethical yeah, craft, for example, then very often, yeah, they buy that in ethical shops. Yeah, there's very often a connection there. But there are two big differences between consumer and trade. And you need to be very aware of this because it is actually really important around yeah, when you are approaching your clients, especially. So I'm just giving you quickly the answer there. But trade clients, and this is really interesting, trade clients are far easier to identify individually than consumers are. It's a huge advantage when you're working with trade clients as opposed to consumers is that you can identify them. Like you can, with a bit of research this afternoon, identify 30 uh, yeah, stockists, uh, interior designers, people like that. Uh, you, can fin uh, you can find their websites, you can research them, you can get their names, their e addresses, emails. You might have to phone them up for some of this, but basically you can really locate them. And creating a database is one of the most effective marketing things you can do. And indeed, by uh, yeah, looking at trade buyers like that and becoming more specific about who you want to deal with and find out more about them by doing a little bit of research can really, really help you. On the other hand, consumers, you always will have to go indirectly. You don't know if three streets away from you, your ideal client lives unless they come to certain craft fairs or unless they read certain magazines, for example, it's very difficult to get in front of them, to be honest with you. So you need to start thinking if you want to reach your consumer clients a lot more, where are they? Where do they indeed hang out? What are the specific events do they go to? Do they go to the higher end craft fairs or are they more interested indeed in organic markets, for example? Or do they only shop online? Also start to use hashtags and keywords a lot more specifically because social media can be a great way for people, yeah, for individual people to actually identify you and get to find your website. So yeah, be very, uh, use, yeah, use that very uh, strategically because that can really help to drive traffic to your website. And look at the specialist magazines or niche blogs that I read or things like that, maybe even podcasts that you could uh, yeah, broadcast on so that those people get to know of you and then indeed start to come to your website and hopefully at some point buy. Trade clients are very similar to your consumers. They often have a similarity in style. They're very often also very passionate about what they do. Yeah, and but the thing is that they have, of course, a slight more commercial element that they also need to think about. So when it comes to, indeed, your trade clients, they will also think, will this yeah, piece from you indeed sell better than what I've got already? How is this going to attract your clients? So 
when it comes to indeed, yeah, thinking about the motivation of why trade clients buy from you, do take that kind of commercial element into consideration as well. Okay, so all good and well, Patricia, thanks very much for talking about, yeah, these kind of different clients, but like, how do I go about identifying my ideal clients? So as I said, don't put them all in one collage or in one persona because it becomes chaos. You really literally get like a monster with three heads and 15 hands or something like that. But really start to look at yeah, groups of people together. And depending a bit on what you do uh, and the, yeah, the, the lifestyle groups, for example, within, yeah, again, what you offer, there will be different groups that are buying from you. If you're selling both products as well as commissions or workshops, those might be three different groups full stop. A lot of this is common sense, basically. Yeah, it's basically, it's not rocket science. A lot of marketing actually is, yeah, very straightforward if you know what you're doing, of course. So have people already shown an interest in what you do and start to think in it when you know what kind of work you create, what your values are, what is important to you, the kind of design style you use, who would be interested in that? Yeah, if your work is very over the top and elaborate and very decorative, it is very unlikely that somebody who is very interested in very minimal aesthetics will be interested in what you do. Sometimes there might be an interesting, <laughs> yeah, but like most of the time, there will not be a huge overlap. Another great way about identifying your ideal clients is observation. And of course, it's a little bit hard in the moment around doing events, yeah, because many live events, of course, now during the pandemic are still not happening. But like when you're doing live events, when you're face to face with your clients, look at who are they? Yeah, back to indeed like the basics around indeed like yeah gender, age and things like that. But maybe also have a conversation with your clients when you are doing these events. Find out a little bit more about them. Be a bit more nosy, I would say. But also, yeah, look at visiting shops and galleries. Talk to people who are exhibiting or talk to people indeed who are working in shops and galleries, for example. That can really give you a lot of information. And then things that I think is really underestimated is your own internal research. You will have a lot of very useful market research already in terms of your website traffic. So use Google Analytics, indeed, how many people are coming to your site, which countries are they coming from, uh, yeah, which pages are, for example, really popular. But also look at your sales statistics identify who your best clients actually are. This is really interesting thing called the Pareto uh, principle or the 2080 rule, which basically says that 20% of your clients are responsible for 80% of your turnover. And yeah, don't take me for the exact numbers for that, but it's very, very interesting and very often the case that a small group of your clients is actually responsible for quite a large amount of your sales. Very, very interesting. So start to focus indeed at what we call lifetime value. Check in on your accounts and see if you can indeed add up, let's say, all the invoices that you send out over the last two or three years and see who is then, yeah, the person who bought the most from you. Look at who's the, yeah, the top 20 of your best clients and start to do a bit of research are they male, female? Where do they live? Things like that can really tell you a lot. When do they buy, for example? And even your social media stats can really give you quite a lot of information. Again, even if you're not selling yet about who your clients are. And then use a bit of a good dollop of what I would call realistic imagination. Who would you like to work with? Yeah, use a bit of facts. But indeed, have a bit of an imagination. Yeah, which galleries or shops will be interested? Which magazines would they read? And really create a yeah, persona partly based on people that you already know or people that you are already selling to, but add a little bit more to it as such. And indeed, like some of those questions, you might want to ask some of your clients, but also just... Yeah, really imagine being that person. What are the answers that they will be giving to some of those questions? 
if you're really struggling to identify who your ideal clients are, a really good starting point might be, yeah, who are your role models or who do your competitors sell to? And I don't want to be cheeky and I don't want you to do anything nasty, but like it's fairly easy, especially when it comes to trade clients, to gallery shops, interior designers, to find out who your competitors or role models are selling to. And that can be a really great starting point for you to identify yeah, who you potentially could sell to, to create a database, to create your own network and a fantastic list indeed of people that you can follow on social media. Very often when I'm teaching graduates, when it comes to market research, they very often refer to trend reports or big business reports or things like that. Uh, very often people indeed, when they are sharing with me business plans, they talk about, oh, I want to get 1% of the market share. I would stay very, very clear of that because you as a one person band, which most creatives are, yeah, it's not relevant for you. But I have to say, Anita, and like, yeah, I am really excited that I was invited by the Crafts Council today. The, the Crafts Council Market for Craft full report and the new data tool that Julia is going to talk about in a minute really have got some very juicy general information, but also quite specific psychological information that can really help you to identify a lot more who your ideal clients are. And then remember also, your ideal clients are often a reflection of you, what you stand for, your values, if you're ethical or sustainable or friendliness or things like that. They very often yeah, share your passions. They very often are very, very similar. But at the same time, you're not exactly your ideal client. And very often, indeed, especially in terms of maybe income, it might be a little bit different. Yeah, but they are very often a reflection of who you are. What I find very often when designer makes, when creatives tell me like, oh, I find this really difficult. What is very often the case is that they are not really clear about yet who they are. They try to be a bit everything to everybody. What we have found with the design tools very strongly is the clearer that you are about who you are and what you stand for, the easier it is to identify your ideal clients. One of my favorite, yeah, kind of angles or, yeah, uh, tips I would give to especially new creatives is really look at what is your niche and dare to go niche. And I would say, especially now when economically it might be a bit more tricky for some of you to sell. If you're trying to be in the middle and you're trying to please everybody, you are in a really competitive, busy place. Really start to be a lot more specific with what you do. And also, a lot of creative work is being bought, yeah, for very personal reasons. It's far easier for me to go to John Lewis or to go indeed to yeah, a department store and buy there a present for friends or something like that. Really start to become a lot more aware that people buy from creatives like you for very personal and very unique reasons. And therefore, very often they want something a bit more special that they can't get anywhere else. And make that a lot more the angle that you look at when you are selling your work. So why is, yeah, understanding all this data, this market research, the client personas, all the numbers, et cetera, so important. So why do you need to understand and need who your clients are? You might never really have thought about your clients and they need, I work very often with new graduates and they really haven't thought through who their ideal clients are going to be or should be potentially. So for me, it's like if you don't understand who your clients are, then how can you create the best products or services? If you're just creating in a vacuum and you're just creating for you, that's all good and well, but that's not really um, yeah, a good starting point for a business as such. Really researching, understanding, having some empathy for your clients can really help you save a lot of time, money, and energy. And for me, my clients are one of my biggest inspirations, to be honest. 
I, yeah, the insights I get from talking to my clients by, yeah, listening to their questions, their concerns, their worries, that really constantly helps me to create better workshops, create better blog posts and things like that. Remember, as I said earlier, people buy creative products and services from people and they buy more than just a product. They're buying into you a little bit. And that doesn't mean that they want to know, yeah, what you had for breakfast or what dog you own or anything like that. But it's really looking at what are your skills, your story, your professionalism in many ways. It's really about that emotional connection with you. And like, for example, I work with a lot of uh, makers in Cornwall. And I know it's really tough to live in Cornwall. Yeah, there's a lot of people with a second house there and a lot of artists in Cornwall. It looks a lot more romantic than it is in real life. I'm very aware of that. But still, if you share that freedom and the beauty of the Cornish coast, yeah, people love buying into that romantic idea of yeah, the creative working from the seaside, so to speak. What is also interesting, if the client is aware that you understand them, that you take the care to actually connect with them at that deeper level, they start to trust you a lot more. It's about building relationships. And indeed, again, with crafts, it is about so much more than just buying a product. Yeah, it's really about that deeper understanding. And clients will find out very quickly if you care about them and that is really what we're talking about this is not about being cynical this is not about having kind of some sales ploy or something like this this is genuinely being interested in other people and therefore creating better work and indeed yeah communicating better also your clients develop they grow just like you will be growing within your business so anticipate what else they might be buying from you they move into different yeah, life cycles or new trends or, yeah, of course, technology wise, so much has changed in the last few years. And again, you develop along with that, but also your clients, especially when you're looking at commissions, you're co-creating with clients. And it's very much about hand holding. If somebody trusts you to create their engagement ring or their wedding ring, like, wow. They, they need to feel that connection with you and that they know that you understand them. Very often when it comes to commissions, you're co-creating. It is about that process, not just the end product. And it's about helping them to identify what is right for them. And it's really about indeed like having that empathy for your clients and really caring for them in many ways. So very often I find, especially with yeah, new creatives, they don't really know who their clients are. It's some kind of abstract entity or they're talking about the algorithm or the numbers. For me, clients aren't numbers. They really are real life human beings and become a bit more inquisitive, empathic and creative around the work that you create and indeed also like how you connect and present yourself to them. So how can all this yeah, practical market research, client persona, and things like that really help you in your craft business? As I said, like understanding your clients at a deeper psychological level will help you to create better, more relevant work. Try to stand in their shoes and get indeed inspired by them. Create other colors or different variations, for example. I was recently working with a ceramicist and up to now she was quite safe in the kind of work that she had created, mostly vessels up to like 200, 250 pounds. And I was talking to her and I said like, oh, like with your delicate work, you really need to make something bigger. And she was really concerned about it. Anyway, she did a show and then she phoned me up the same day and she said like, Patricia, it's been amazing. I introduced a couple of bigger pieces at 700, 800 pounds, and they've all sold today. She says, I can't believe it. And she said, they all loved it. And they were, went all indeed to existing collectors. I wasn't surprised by that because she basically really, yeah, could show this work. And those collectors were really looking for these bigger pieces, for example. So really start to indeed think a bit more about variations. Look at work that is already selling 
And what else could you create for your existing audience? Also, I find the more that you know your clients, the more that you see it as building relationships rather than just a sale, I find that that really raises my own confidence. And it really can help you because it will help you to visualize who your clients are and then approaching them in their language, in the way that you present yourself, that feels a lot more true to who you are as well. Because remember, you and your clients are in a way like a mirror. It can help you with your brand, your website, and really creating something that really resonates. I have to say, most websites, I think, are utterly boring. <laughs> and very often I say to my clients, be a bit more like Marmite. Yeah, you need to put certain people off. People either love Marmite or they hate Marmite. There's no kind of gray in between. If you really want people to fall in love with what you do, what you actually need to do is that you put certain people off. Dare to be a lot more yourself indeed. And that starts very often with your website and the way that you present yourself. Recently, I was looking at a website indeed, and I got goosebumps. It was so beautifully presented. That is sort of the connection you want your clients to have with your website, with your work. What would it take for you to have indeed that yeah, impact on your potential clients? Look at creating collections rather than just individual items. Yeah, really look at telling the story a lot more and create something for a specific client groups. That can really help you to tell a bigger story, your own themes, your own interests and passions. It becomes also easy to sell more. And retailers, shops and galleries love collections as well, because again, it makes a bigger splash. For example, if they have got five or 10 pieces in the shop window, rather than just the one. So really go more specific and niche, rather than yeah, trying to be everybody's friend. That can really help you with that. Okay, so how can this research help you? Remember those questions, very basic, but very powerful questions. When do they buy? Basically, that is about identifying the trigger for your clients. Many businesses are seasonal. When do you need to launch collections? What is the right time? Very often for designer makers, that's, for example, in yeah, the end of September, early October, for example. Then put a lot more effort into, indeed, creating a marketing bus with social media campaigns, emails, and things like that. And you will get a far better result, indeed. Connect and, uh, yeah, and name live events, for example. Talk about in case studies around commissions because people bought something because they have a nursery or they moved to indeed their second home in Cornwall or something like that. Really warming up your product descriptions and including more case studies and indeed like showing your commissions in a lot more detail can really, really help you. And really, again, showing that you know what you're talking about, that you are a kind person, that you are an yeah, open person, for example. And by sharing those case studies, you really can give a behind the scenes, which builds up trust for your potential clients. Looking at personalized gifts and commissions, yeah, that's a really good one. Again, connecting with people and using the right keywords to get found, especially in places like Etsy. Where do they look? Do you have a database of potential places? Do you follow them on social media, for example? Do you build yeah, relationships? Do you get their newsletters and their invites for private views? When it comes to trade buyers in particular, it's not just about selling them a couple of pots. It's about building relationships that they get to know you and that you get to know them. And then everything works a lot easier. Why do they buy? Really emphasize in your images, in all your communications, a lot more that connection of why do people buy. And I have to say, Julia is going to explain in a minute a lot more about the Market for Craft report, but especially the last four or five pages of that report, I found were very, very strong. They're talking there about the culture segments, and it's the reasons why people buy yeah, crafts. And it's absolutely fascinating. It's very rich. And I really do think you should be, be reading it. But it really gives you, for example, you might think 
that people are really interested uh, yeah, to support local or small businesses or things like that. The reality is, of course, not everybody is interested in that. Different people have different kind of angles or different motivations to buy from you. It might be that they want yeah, early access, that they want to be the most trendy person and therefore they buy from you because as a small producer, you can be far quicker than many of the bigger producers. Maybe it is because they want a really deeper connection with you. Maybe they want to have the gorgeousness of something, or it might be that local connection or ethics or things like that. There's a whole range of motivations. Really start to become a lot more aware of why people buy from you. And then also, of course, why do people stop buying from you and overcome these challenges? We very often see with the design trust that people have not got enough images, for example, on their website of one product. We highly recommend that you put at least six images from the front, from the side, the inside, really close up so that you can really see the quality of your work, for example. Images are very important in answering a lot of the questions of your clients. So a couple of examples. This was indeed the website that gave me goosebumps. Sally Burnett really understands who her clients are. She really presents it in a way as what they were expecting. Beautiful images, nice descriptions, interesting names, lovely, simple, understated website. This is somebody who really shows the application of really knowing who her clients are. The lovely Sebastian Cox, he is very interested in sustainability as a furniture maker. And he really, yeah, walks the walks and talks the talks or whatever it is. He is very interested in sustainability. And for example, he goes as far as inviting his clients to the woods to actually decide exactly which trees to cut for their commissioned yeah, wooden furniture. Unbelievable. But he is so strong with everything he did. And he is such an advocate really around sustainability. Really, really wonderful. He very often takes his team out on yeah, woodworking adventures and things like that. Of course, many creatives are very interested in sustainability, which is a great thing. But there are very few people who take it as far as Sebastian does. And I think he's a great example of really the values and, and what he is about and really presenting that. And then when you buy from him, you commission from him, you really buy into that whole package. Very, very interesting. Not always easy. I think he has sometimes very difficult decisions to be made when it comes to sustainability, but he's very, very impactful around that and a great example for anybody interested in sustainability. Another great one, one of our favorites at the Design Trust is Bronwyn Grillam. And she's an older uh, jeweler. She hasn't been going that long, but Bronwyn really is very interested in recycled jewelry. And she very often indeed goes to uh, yeah, the beach to collect old plastic and stuff like that and makes new jewelry from that. And what I really like, yeah, Bronwyn really presents that whole story, the sustainability, her as a person. She doesn't shy away, but she is always friendly. She is extremely good when it comes to email marketing. She's one of the most consistent creatives when it comes to yeah doing the right kind of emails and for example this is yeah from uh from the autumn where she really shares uh yeah a series of online events for example that she was doing and again really really understanding her client and connecting with that client and why they buy and why they're interested in another great example here is Jillis jones they are a, a partnership in yorkshire and they create glass very much inspired by the Yorkshire Dales. And here is just a great example there on, on the top. You can very much, they're very much talking about the landscape, uh, where they live. Those are the pictures you see. And again, they're on the left. That is their Instagram feed, very strongly connecting between where they are locally and the landscape and how that impacts on them. And again, some clients are very, very interested in that, again, to buy from them. 
And here, Angie Parker, another great example of a textile artist, very interested in yeah, manufacturing, scaling up, uh, very much talking about commissions, yeah, very kind of professional around that, but also, again, having that very strong local link. Um, Angie is a fantastic ambassador in Bristol, helps many, many young creatives in Bristol and beyond, I would say, indeed, as an ambassador. But also, indeed, recently, she launched the Bristol Blanket with, like, yeah, the, the local kind of mill and I think, again, really interested, inspired by, indeed, yeah, the colourful buildings that we all know in Bristol. Very interesting, again, really communicating that connection with a local area. So, remember, you create and sell a lot more than just a product. Yeah, and it's very important that you remember that. And getting to know your clients at a deeper level can really help you to connect with the emotions behind it a lot more. And indeed, it's not what you do that makes you unique. There's so many, yeah, jewelers especially, so many people that do very similar work. But starting to look why you do something, your motivations, why are you a creative, why are you a ceramicist, and how you execute that. Start to focus on that a lot more because that will really resonate with your clients and that will really make it a lot more impactful and a lot more special to buy from you. So I hope that that gave you some idea around yeah, how to create your own client personas, use this kind of information, go a bit deeper. And I really invite you indeed yeah, to go there and ask those simple questions to yourself and create indeed those client collages too. Thank you so much, Patricia, for that really inspiring talk. So much information there um, for everyone. And um, we, we're sort of running, racing ahead with time here. So I think I'm just going to ask Tambi, is there one question from the Q&A that we could go to now that I'm sure quite a lot of people have been asking through that talk? <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> Thank you all for joining. Um, Yes, I think there was, there's been a lot and I've been really trying to answer a few if I can, um, but I've added an email address if I can't get to it. But I think it's about sort of guessing almost um, for people who don't currently have a, a, um, a client base. So they don't have those opportunities to observe their customers directly. Um, how can you sort of empathize with that um, and validate those assumptions that you're making? I think that's the key one. So you need to make some assumptions. Yes. Yeah? So any like very basic, like if your work is very organic, yeah, and maybe I don't know, you're a vegetarian, then yeah, like <laughs> that is saying something about you and that will attract a certain kind of client base. Yeah. Um, the reality is start somewhere a little bit. Yeah. That would be like, what are the people who are not going to be interested in what you do? Yeah. We very often say 99% of the people are not going to be interested in what you do. And that's a good thing, by the way. Yeah. And for some of you, 99.9999% of the population are not going to be interested in what you do. If you had 40 clients a year, you would have a great business. Start somewhere. Yeah. Start to make some assumptions based on yeah, what you're creating. Who would be interested in that? Then start to think, why would they be interested in that? And go deeper and deeper. I've been doing this work for 25 years. I still learn every single day. And there's still sometimes that I get it utterly wrong, that I think like things are going to be a certain way and it don't happen exactly like that. That's part of the learning. Yes, yeah? so, but get started somewhere and go deeper and deeper. Peel the onion from yourself and from your clients step by step. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, I'm sure there are loads and loads more questions and I'm sure um, everyone can, can connect with you, whether it's via Instagram or your um, website, thedesigntrust.co.uk. Conscious of time though, I'd like to invite my colleague, Julia Bennett, our Head of Research and Policy to come and join us. Over to you, Julia. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure you can share your screen once uh, Patricia has unshared hers and then we can start with your presentation. Sorry, I'm just checking how I can unshare. Um, maybe. At the top of your screen, I think, Patricia. Ah, yeah. Thank you very much. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Over Thanks, to you. Patricia, and 
Thanks very much, Caroline. Uh, very good to be with you this afternoon. As Caroline said, I'm Head of Research and Policy at the Crafts Council. And what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is tell you a little bit about our research programme, introduce you, if you don't already know it, to our report, The Market for Craft, that Patricia mentioned, and do a demonstration of our new data tool, which we're quite excited by. So the Crafts Council regularly undertakes research. The purpose of our research is to try and gather an evidence base so that we can improve the conditions for craft, for makers, for consumers, for everyone's enjoyment and participating in craft. We undertake research ourselves, but also with partners quite often in higher education. Where we've focused in the past is around, for example, craft education and training, because as we all know, there are many areas where that's under threat. We are doing quite a lot of research at the moment about tackling inequality within our sector. And also we've done, we've undertaken, and so has Caroline and her team undertaken quite a lot of research on craft businesses. For example, we've looked at exports in the past, we've looked at craft and social enterprises. And most recently we published the market for craft. This was last year. We felt very much that there hadn't been enough research for us all to understand that market, but more particularly to know how to respond to that market. So we were keen to um, understand it, to commission research from others, from, in this case, uh, MHM, Morris Hargreaves McIntyre. And they undertook a research report for us last, that we published last summer, the biggest survey for 10 years on the market for craft. Some of the headlines from that research, I can run past you, but we have the full report online, as well as here, the executive summary. And it's set out in a way that MHM, the consultants, drew on their culture segments profiles where they segment the market. And through that, they've produced these culture segments analyses at the back of the report. At the front of the report, we've got some consumer profiles broken down into some half a dozen different individuals of the kind of uh, answering the kind of questions or asking the kind of questions as well that Patricia was talking about earlier. Some of the headlines from the report, well, Within the UK, 73% of adults are in the market for craft, predominantly buyers, but also those people indicating that they were interested in joining that market. That amounts to 45 million people existing and potential buyers, with an annual value of three billion pounds, which is quite considerable. So we undertook that report through a demographically balanced survey of the market of consumers. So that was 5,300 people across the UK. But we also wanted to compare a little bit with uh, a foreign market. So we did a, a quite a large scale survey um, was undertaken for us in New York and in Los Angeles, two US cities, where we discovered that 85% of people are in the market for crafts, so even higher than in the UK. What we also found from that, that analysis is that across the UK, what's really interesting is there is a much younger set of people buying craft than there were 10 years ago. A third of the people buying craft today are under 35. Many of them will define themselves as collectors without necessarily feeling they need to be an expert in that discipline or in that field, but because they simply like collecting. We've also got in the report a section on makers. We surveyed makers in the UK. We got over 700 people responding. So we've got lots of details about you, about where you make, what your level of income is, your turnover, how long you've been in the market, whether you've exported. So you can maybe benchmark yourself and your business against that data. And the report took place in the context of a growing number of trends that I'm sure many of you will recognize. The growing visibility of craft on TV, which is fantastic. We've all enjoyed those TV programs about textiles, about ceramics, and now about jewellery. There's also been a number of changes in the routes to market for craft. Certainly a growth in online channels, whether particularly during the pandemic, people have been using their own websites and doing direct sales, or whether it's using platforms such as Etsy and Folksy. Interestingly, though, 
the consumers still prefer in the main in the UK buying face to face. There's also a growing popularity of craft as a leisure activity, increasing participation, and particularly during lockdown, craft was one of the most popular artistic leisure time pursuits. So as I say, the report goes into craft consumption by discipline, by region, by age, by media habits of consumers, and many other areas, and it illustrates maker trends. So let's have a look now at the data tool. This is the full report. Down here, we can go into the Market for Craft data tool. So on this page, we've got some background about the key areas of focus in the tool, and I'll come on to that in a moment, as well as how to use it. We've got some guidance covering a number of areas. We've also got a short video you can watch if you prefer to learn in that way. So if I now launch the tool for you and introduce you to it, click here. This is, ah, here we go, we're getting there. So let me just take you through what you're looking at here. And apologies, my screen on the laptop is slightly small. But what we've got across the top here is the key main data areas that we looked at. So buying behavior, for example, psychographic profile of buyers that Patricia also mentioned, the demographic profiles and participation as well. There's a link here to a feedback survey as well. If you think it's great, let us know. If you think it's just not working for you, uh, please let us know as well. Uh, just getting rid of the pictures of, of, of us as speakers there, so you can see the full chart or the full dashboard. What we've got on the, on the data tool at the moment is the default position, which is the market breakdown of craft by country. So we've got whether they're rejectors, buyers, potential buyers by each of the four countries of the UK. Not only have we got a chart, we've also got a table below of the market breakdown. And that breaks it down by some of the maker pro sorry, the consumer profiles that I mentioned before. Just looking at some of the tools we've got on here as well. What we have here is a place where you select the chart questions. When you've made a chart, you can export it. So you can export it into Excel or as a chart, take it away with you, you'll have a look at it. Over here, we've got the sample size on the left, so how many people were included. Down below, let's have a look at the table here. Again, you've got that same menu here where you can select table questions and you have the opportunity to export it as well. So that's the full visuals with on the right here, a further filter. So there's a whole range of different filters that you can ask, attitude to risk, educational attainment of, of consumers, knowledge of craft. It's a wealth of information. So why don't we give it a go? Have a look at a couple of examples. What I'd like to look at first is, so if you're a maker in the Northwest, I'm sure we've got some people join us from the Northwest today, and you're a ceramicist, what proportion of people aged, say, 35 to 64 buy ceramics compared to other crafts in the Northwest? Well, We've got several variables here, so you can only do a couple here in a chart. So what we need to do, therefore, is pick a table. And we're going to do that by looking at buying behaviour first, because we want to find out about buyers of craft. That's already changed what we see at the moment. So then we need to go into our table and select the table questions. We click on these three lines and a box comes up. Have you ever bought original handmade crafts? That's what we want, and we want all of those questions. So we'll click on that. Then we wanted to look at what type of crafts people buy. So let's scroll down here. Types of craft bought. You could deselect all and pick specific ones, but let's have a look at ceramics against all the others. You click on there. You collapse those questions and then you click OK, so it saves it. So what happens now is that we've got people, 
across the country and what their buying habits are for different craft disciplines, but we want to filter that further. So let's go over to this tool on the right. I talked about age. So let's have a look, not at all ages, but let's look at say people aged 35 to 64. I also mentioned that you might want to do this for your region or your country for that matter. It breaks down by country of the UK as well. But let's go here, not for all regions. Let's go, as I mentioned, for the Northwest. Then we have to go back up to the top and apply that. And here we go. So this is people in the Northwest, 78% of whom have bought ceramics. But it's interesting if you're a ceramicist because actually slightly more people, 84% have bought glasswork in the Northwest. And indeed that's the, the top purchase in the discipline. Just over here, just to say we've got figures in red. When they're in red, they're small numbers. So they're slightly less reliable statistically. So that's looking at purchasing by discipline. Let's look at something else now. Patricia mentioned workshops and an increasing number of makers I think are running workshops for people to enjoy making craft and learning how to. So let's look here at participation. And I think what we should do is look at how do people, younger people compare with older people by their interests, by their spare time activity and their interest in going to craft workshops. So again, we've got several variables. Whereas it shows here the different interests of people buying craft. Let's go down and make it slightly more complicated. Let's select a table again. So here we click again on the menu. And what we want to look at here is which of any of the following activities you've done in your spare time. We don't want to break that down. We want to select that all. So we'll keep it there. Then we want to go to the age of the, sorry, the activities of people and the age. And this is looking now at the column. So we've selected the row for the table. We're now going to look at the column. We now want to look at age. We don't want to look at all ages. So we unclick that. We want to look at 16 to 34 year olds and then at people over 65. So we collapse that again. Click OK so it saves it. Over here, though, we don't want these variables that we had before, so we need to just take them out. That's why we haven't got any information over here on the left hand side yet. So then we want to go into what is it that people are interested in doing? It's workshops. We don't want to know if people don't want to do a workshop, so we deselect. And then we click for those people who definitely would want to attend, probably would, and possibly would. And we apply that. It's just loading the dashboard here. So this is quite interesting again when you look at it. Sometimes you come across things you don't necessarily expect. If you're younger, if you're under 34, what you tend to do in your spare time is painting, drawing, printmaking or sculpture. If you're interested in attending a craft workshop. But if you're older, 65 and over, the main activity you do in your spare time is textile crafts. So the reason I'm picking these is that if, for example, you're somebody who wants to or already does do workshops, what you want to do is focus your marketing or focus where you advertise. This will help you determine the kind of places and the kind of activities, those kind of people you're trying to appeal to. So I'm just going to um, go back now and look Having looked at the tool itself, I've just gone back to the page it launches from, just to let you know again that this guidance we've got covers selecting those questions, tables and themes, filtering the data, exporting the results. And it also gives you a full list of all the questions asked in the survey. So you can look and see, has it covered this or hasn't it covered it? There's a number of scenarios also set out that takes you through how to do it which newspapers do people read by age in Northern Ireland, for example, if they're potential buyers? And what proportion of people buy textiles online in Scotland? So here you can download the guidance. And here, as I said before, you can do a short video of my wonderful colleague, Leah, talking you through it.
So I'm going to stop sharing my screen there. It's a complicated tool, but I hope fairly straightforward. What I'm going to suggest to you is that you have a play around with it after we finish this webinar. If it makes sense to you, great. If it doesn't make sense to you, get in touch with us either at makeadev at craftscouncil.co.uk or at research at craftscouncil.org, sorry, not .co.uk. And we're really happy to pick up some of your questions. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. That was super interesting and definitely worth having a play. Um, I uh, just seeing those statistics but, uh, in the experience economy between um, the younger age group and the older age group, you have certain perceptions of what people would be interested in. And just to see the data there, that it doesn't meet your expectations is really quite fascinating. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people have found that useful and we'll be going away to, to play with that now. Um, I'm going to bring Patricia back on board and to Tanvi. And Tanvi, are there any uh, particular questions that have cropped up in the Q&A for either Julia or Patricia or both? Right, <laughs> I've been frantically typing. Um, so I'm hoping we've sort of covered most of it. Um, I some really lovely ones actually just comments actually more than questions about um wanting to try eager to try the tool and i think um if people can go away and try that and then come back to us in feedback how you how you felt it was how it was for you um that would be really great but um i'm just trying to think which i think it was more about the um how to sort of know if you're to really, I think it was more about Patricia's talk about empathizing with the, the sort of target con customer. And if you're trying to attract new customers, um, I just think it would be really interesting that there's a lot of questions about accessing the tool. So I'm going to put that link back in again. But it was around sort of the um, empathizing and finding, um, I think there was one that I had actually highlighted. Let's try to find it now. Um, to reach new markets. So somebody wanted to offer high end um, sort of commissions, um, but if you don't have a history of clients in that particular area, so moving from a product based uh, market to, to sort of bespoke commissions. That's for Patricia. Okay, I don't know if it is um, like, okay, my, my suggestion with that is like, yeah, you need to build your profile credibility and trust yes yeah? so one of the things when we're talking about marketing is people only buy from people they know like and trust so if you're moving into a complete new area especially if it is more higher end and especially if it is commissions that are actually more intangible yeah with a with a teapot i can show the teapot and i say okay this is 300 pounds and people can make a judgment but like when it comes to commissions what I'm actually looking at, yes. Yeah? So what you need to really look at is, okay, have you got case studies? Share your case studies a lot more. Have you done other projects? Maybe start with a project with a family member or somebody you know already, who already trusts you and loves you and <laughs> wants to work with you. Learn from that. Do include the images on, yeah, on your website and things like that. Create a bit of a case study when you do have an event hand those out. Or if you want to work with interior designers, write up case studies that you've done before of working with interior designers and put that in as a package. Yeah, you have to start somewhere. Yeah, so get started somewhere. Yes, yeah, start small. What can you do for 500 pounds? Don't jump in straight ahead with 5,000 pounds. That will be my advice on that. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much. Um, and, uh, and I think there is, there is so much to capture there from everyone today. But I, I think the clear message is start somewhere. Um, and if anything, if you're not sure where to start, I think the exploring the data tool is a really great place to start. Um, and, you know, getting in contact with us, exploring the types of questions that are on offer there thinking about your demographic. I love those takeaways of be curious, be much more curious into who your customers are and uh, identifying, we taught our first talk about values and, and how identifying your values, being really clear and confident about that in the way you communicate that 
builds trust, authenticity, which then your clients will follow. And I think that's a really lovely pathway to sort of build on here. Uh, so thank you so much, Patricia, for joining us today and giving us so much content. Thank you so much to Julia uh, for taking us through that rather complex tool, but actually so enlightening, so really worth exploring. And thank you for Tanvi for filtering all of the questions all going on. So many complex things going on there. Um, and thank you to Crafting Europe for funding these talks. Uh, just to say that our next talk is on the 2nd of June. That's Wednesday, the 2nd at 1 p.m., getting the most out of Instagram. I'm going to ask Tanvi to release our poll. I would love to hear um, your insight into how you found today's talk. And uh, yeah, do, do join us uh, again in two weeks' time. As I said at the beginning, this talk has been recorded. We will make this live next week and share the wonderful slides that Patricia has provided us and the great links that Julia has given us for, for the data tool. Uh, so thank you everyone for listening. Um, and yes, yeah, stay in touch.